LAist Studios. Back in the spring of 2022, I took a flight from LA up to Northern California. When I landed at the tiny airport, I hopped into my rental car, drove over to a newly built suburban neighborhood on the outskirts of Santa Rosa, and parked in front of a farmhouse style home. It's a nice yard. A rain garden out front, and embedded in the front step, a metal plate with a phoenix rising from ashes. Hi. This is Jacob. Shoes on or off? Um, whatever. I'm at home with Hi. Melissa Geisinger, who takes me inside. Books, toys, and art projects all over. Oh Barnaby the puppy so running excited, around. Barnaby. And her mom, Nancy, sitting with her son, Apollo, who's jumping on the couch. Hi, Apollo. It's really nice to meet you. I'm Jacob. What are you guys playing? Um, Minecraft Dungeons. Oh, yeah? What's your favorite thing to build in Minecraft Dungeons? Uh, I really like building houses. That's awesome. Yeah. It's not immediately obvious that this entire place was a pile of ash just five years ago. Whether you remember it or not, you've actually been here before with Melissa when she was pregnant with Apollo back in the first episode. On that violent, windy night in 2017, when the Tubbs fire tore through the place, we're standing now, Coffee Park. The moment I stepped out the front door, there was this wall of thick, hot air that just hit and it immediately dried out my mouth all the way down into my throat and I couldn't breathe I grabbed a bowl of fruit (laughs) it's that was weird yeah I was like I might be hungry later I'm just like thinking of the baby I called my mom and I was sobbing and I just remember telling her like my house is gonna be gone And I just remember seeing the the skyline of Santa Rosa completely on fire. And it was so surreal. It was terrifying. Do you want to, um, hey, Apollo, do you want to help me show Jacob around the house? Um, yeah. What's your favorite part of the house? My bedroom. Your bedroom? Yeah. Yeah. Just the fact that we're now standing here watching the Apollo show, as Melissa calls it, is a big deal. Oh, this is a perfect room. This looks exactly like my kid's room. What's your favorite part of your room? The toys. The toys. You have good toys. What's your favorite part of the house? Whatever room I'm in at that time. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a long and difficult five years for Melissa. Shortly after the fire, she gave birth to Apollo, and he was rushed into surgery. A brand new baby who had to have his heart repaired right away. And then, in the midst of the recovery, they had to evacuate from another fire at another house they were staying at. Then, Melissa and her husband split up, and it was finally after three years of dealing with insurance and builders, she got the keys to her new home in May of 2020. There wasn't a lot that survived, and the things that did that were recognizable and that already had, you know, some, you know, special significance. Melissa's holding on closely to things that remind her of the past, that survived the fire. A stack of letters from an old friend from the UK, a signed poster from Kenny Loggins, a stuffed animal from her childhood. And a stupid castle that I had, just like a little castle thing that I had just from when I was a kid and I was trying to sell it in a garage sale, but nobody wanted so it just sat in my garage, but it survived perfectly intact. And so now it's like one of the most precious things that I own. And outside, she has this planter. Do you see that? You see that planter right there? It is part of what was my grandfather's Weber. Bright red, it was bright red. It is now not bright red. It is black and brown and white and Yep, and totally, like, melted in and and folding in upon itself, and it's being used as a planter bed. It's clear Melissa is putting a lot of work into making this place feel good again. And all around the neighborhood, you can see things feel pretty normal. There's play stuff for kids to run around with, and open garages full of tools for weekend projects, RVs parked in driveways. But there are little reminders of what happened, like the signs still up at the front of the community, 
with hashtag coffee strong. And for Melissa, there are still triggers that get her heart rate up, like when the wind starts blowing on a dry night. Anytime I see a trash can in the, in the middle of a road when it's windy, it's like, mm. So inevitably, one of the things that's going to come up, and it comes up anytime I talk about earthquakes, anytime I talk about just anything, you know, here in California, um, do you think that the same thing that happened that night could happen again? If you would have asked me the question right after the fire, if we were worried it would happen again, I would have said no. Because Tubbs was the first in a trend. And at the time, it was not a trend. It was this one-of-a-kind, perfect storm, freak event that we couldn't imagine being repeated. Fast forward almost five years, and what are we looking at? We're looking at a pattern. Do I believe now that it could happen again here? Yeah. When you live in an area that you know could burn again, do you stay or do you go? What goes into that decision? And if you do stay, is there a way that you can build a home to make sure that it'll never burn down again? This is The Big Burn. I'm Jacob Margolis. The Big Burn is sponsored by BetterHelp. The Big Burn is your manual for how to survive in the age of wildfires. Sometimes I wish the rest of life came with a user manual. Navigating any of life's challenges can make you feel unsure whether it's a career change, a new relationship, or becoming a parent. That's where BetterHelp Online Therapy comes in. BetterHelp therapists are trained to help you figure out the cause of challenging emotions and learn productive coping skills. It's like getting a guided tour of the complex engine called you. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists. It's 100% online, so it's accessible from anywhere, plus it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. Couldn't be simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash bigburn. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash big burn. Over the past decade, California has been hit by nine out of the 10 largest fires on record. Our worsening fire season can be attributed to both climate change and poor policy decisions. But there are things we can do at the individual level to create change, like voting. With the midterm elections underway, I invite you to check out the voter guide from my colleagues at LAist to get unbiased, fact-based reporting on the candidates and measures on your ballot. Educated and informed voting is your chance to let your voice be heard. Visit LAist.com slash vote to learn more. Hey. Hello. Nice to see you. I wanted to know if Melissa really had anything to worry about. So I met up with a guy named David Shu, who's got this big, bushy white mustache and a ton of energy at the big park in the middle of the neighborhood. I'm curious if we can walk, you know, maybe to one of these homes or just check up whatever. And you could say, well, this is good. This is still a concern. Something like that. Um, yeah, I have a I have a thought about going over here okay. a, a block or two. Yeah, and sure. If you if you want to just walk for a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you couldn't pick a nicer day to go for a walk, though. No, this is beautiful. David worked with Cal Fire for 32 years, and then as the chief for planning and risk analysis for the state fire marshal's office, where he oversaw statewide fire prevention programs. Now he's a consultant, doing things like telling insurance agencies how to best prep a home so that it doesn't burn down. And as we start walking through the neighborhood, David points to the first house that we come across. So here at this uh, house here on the corner that we're looking at, it's a new two-story residential home uh, with some uh, nice landscaping around it. But should a future fire come in this direction, the fencing attached to the house, the landscaping, the, the bark mulch especially... Uh, makes this home extremely vulnerable to ember ignitions. <laughs> yeah. As we keep walking, he keeps finding problems. 
things that could put homes at risk in another wildfire. There is a wood bark mulch covering the front lawn area. Tell me why bark mulch is a problem. Bark mulch is very fine kindling. It's very dry uh, here in California. Uh, it has new wood the conflict that, that is attached directly to the house itself, wood fences can act like a candle wick where a wood fence can ignite on fire and then carry that fire directly to the house. You see the rafter tails coming out. Those features in a design of a home allow embers to have more areas that they can catch onto and ignite the structure. Bushes and trees pressed up right against homes that can catch on fire and burn windows and siding, exposed eaves that could trap embers, and so many wood fences. Would you be surprised if in the future Coffee Park burned down again, given what we're seeing here? Well, uh, I, I, I guess I have to say no. It wouldn't surprise me. We walk block after block and see homes that David says don't have basic fire resistance. Sometimes we see one that does, but then the one next door has all the problems. If one house catches on fire, then the one next to it probably will too. There's no consistency across Coffee Park. Even with the more modern building materials, it's vulnerable. I'm going to guess, want to know, like, how, how could this place be allowed to be rebuilt in a way that still leaves it vulnerable to fire after what happened, after it was essentially nuked off the landscape. Expediency. I think um, there was a great desire to try to help people get back to their lives as quickly as possible. And the easiest way to do that is to simply recreate what you know. And it's the path of least resistance. There are different sets of building standards for communities depending on the perceived fire risk. If you're in a very high risk area, you're required to do things like maintain vegetation by as much as 100 feet from your home. But Coffee Park, where we are now, was not rebuilt in accordance with all those strict rules. It didn't have to be. Because according to fire risk maps from both the state and Santa Rosa, it's not in a very high fire hazard severity zone. Even though in the Tubbs fire, 1,300 structures burned down in Coffee Park. The city could have required Coffee Park to be built to stricter building codes. It did not. The standard word on the street is that they feel that it was more or less a one-time freak wind event that'll never happen again. And they feel like they went through the trauma of the fire when it occurred here. Uh, But it's over now. And they don't ever have to worry about it again. And from the direction that we see fire behavior growing, I think I couldn't disagree with that perspective more. (laughs) Two years after Tubbs, Coffee Park had to be evacuated again. uh when the Kincaid fire burned nearby. David says requiring simple things like not allowing flammable wood fences to be right up against homes and building defensible space into landscaping could go a long way. We've hit the tipping point. Now we have to really get serious and make these changes. And the sad answer to that question is that we're apparently not there yet. At what point do we reach some sort of acceptance of... 10,000 homes being lost per year. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that's very difficult to think that that could become normal. Yeah. Um, what do you still need to fix on your home that you embarrassingly haven't changed yet when it comes to wildfire up in, you live up in Napa? <laughs> My wood fences. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> You're killing me. You walked, we just walked around this whole neighborhood. And tell me about your wood fences. Ah, uh, yes, I have wood fences. Um, no, I'm not immune from this at all, but I don't have any bark mulch landscaping. I can guarantee you that. Whether it's fires, earthquakes, tornadoes, or hurricanes, It's easy to look at people who live in high-risk areas and say, why are you putting yourself in that situation? Fix your roof, get a new fence, or just leave. But then you talk to people, and the choice to live in a place like Coffee Park looks a lot more complicated. Why come back here after everything was just absolutely leveled by extreme fire? 
and decide to rebuild. We were just like, okay, what are our options? And when we consulted with our insurance person, you know, he said, you can rebuild on on the same site and they pay like a certain amount for that. Or you can buy another house and they pay so much for that and it's not as much. And so we would be taking a significant loss if we would decide not to rebuild. We're talking, you know, the biggest investment in your life, right? So often why we stay has to do with money. Melissa says that they got more money for rebuilding than they would have gotten if they just relocated. And she's lucky in many ways because lots of Californians can't get insurance that'll help them. And moving somewhere else in California is tough because housing is an unaffordable nightmare. But of course, it's not just about money. There are the intangibles too. If I post on Facebook that I am having a bad day, my neighbors across the street will respond and say, hey, why don't you come over for a glass of wine? And, and I'll say yes. <laughs> you just imagine a group of people who have been through this collective experience. There's just an, there's an unspoken understanding of of the trauma, of the effort it took to come back. Do you ever consider leaving? Do you ever consider selling the house? Do you say, okay, we got like five more years here, something like that, and then I'm kind of done? The thought has definitely crossed my mind. And and I know I've seen neighbors talk about it too. Like if it happens again, I'm gone, I'm done, I'm leaving and (laughs) leaving California, never looking back. And I've thought about it, you know, when when the smoke is thick and ash is raining down from another fire and it's a drought and and everything yeah i mean i i look around sometimes and and i think to myself like what's it going to take you know how how much more am i going to tolerate before i start to think about where else would be better But the world seems to be changing so quickly that, you know, in a, in a few years, the place you end up going could also, oy, you know, it's just, <laughs> what are you going to do? Melissa sounds like a lot of the people I've talked to about this, burned out trying to make the changes necessary to put themselves in a safer position, saving up money to do so, but also just accepting that the worst can happen. And if it does, you just have to make it through. What if, though, you had the option to build a home with the explicit purpose of surviving a disaster in one of the riskiest places in Los Angeles? Because you think you could build it in such a way that it could be all but fireproof. Coming up, We've got the story of one Hollywood stuntman's mission to build what he thinks is a disaster-proof home. And we see what we can learn from it. How to LA is the newest podcast from Elias Studios. We help curious Angelinos connect with their city, discover the new, navigate the confusing, and even drive some change along the way. What I love about LA is all the cultures. This is such a place of connection. All of these creative minds and creative people. Everybody has their own story. With each episode, we're bringing you stories about LA, for LA, by LA. Find How to LA wherever you get your podcasts. One day, I was riding up to Panga Canyon on my bike heading home from the ocean, suffering up the steep hill, when I noticed something unusual. A chunk of hillside was missing, and in its place was half of a giant concrete dome. Wasn't sure what to think of it, but every time I rode by, more dirt was moved, the dome was worked on, until one day, it disappeared. And all that I could see from the road was the hillside again. Well, I found out recently that it's actually a house built into the side of the mountain by a stuntman who loves to tell a story, Eddie Kana. 
I've been dropped off of buildings. I've been lit on fire. I've crashed cars. And then there was a couple. One of the ones I did that was kind of interesting was I went down to Texas and doubled a kid and had to be covered head to toe in live bees. I yelled to Richard, I'm being attacked by bees. Fire Chief Julio Flores took charge of the scene. They just couldn't do it. We didn't have the proper gear for what we encountered. What happened was we had a bee wrangler who brought some queen pheromone and he puts these drops on my clothes and basically the bees can smell that and they immediately encompass me to the point where I had probably half a million, quarter, quarter to a half a million live bees completely on my body. I couldn't even see his eyes. And at first, for about the first two minutes, I had to just sit there because your body, like, you want to just scrape them all off because it, everything's tingling. I think I got stung about 40 or 50 times. You didn't, after that, you weren't like, you weren't like, maybe this isn't for me? Mm -hmm. No, it was one of those things. The funny thing is, shortly after that, I ended up becoming a beekeeper. Eddie Kana's worked on Buffy, Natural Born Killers, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, Fast and Furious 4. The guy's got like 140 credits to his name. I had a friend of mine who I grew up with who, who told me once, he said, he said, what I find interesting about you is you do some of the craziest shit, but you do it in the safest way possible. And that was kind of always my mindset. Most of the stuff that we do as a stunt performer, at least the, the good stunt performers and the good stunt coordinators focus on taking something that is considered risky and then doing everything they can to eliminate as much of that risk as possible. Building dome homes for Eddie is all about eliminating risk. He says he first came across the idea of a concrete shell structure back in the early 2000s when he was looking to build his first dome in another high fire risk part of L.A. called Chatsworth. At the time, Eddie was mostly thinking about how to save on energy. And as it turns out, thick concrete shells buried underground regulate temperature pretty well. I saw where utility bills were going. It started with the energy efficiency. Then as I did more research, it was, oh, geez, I'm building something that is also resistant to fires. It's resistant to earthquakes. It's resistant to mudslides. Um, the structural engineers were telling me that this house should be standing 2,000 years from now. So you're like, why not build, why in LA not build a bunker that could be- Well, I hate the term bunker. It's not an accurate description. Okay. It's not an accurate- Dome. It's not an Sorry. accurate description. Dome? It's, it's a dome-shaped underground house. And, and I love it. You know, it's not a bunker. It doesn't look like a bunker. It kind of looks like a bunker. Anyway, around 2000, Eddie begins building his first not bunker house in Chatsworth. And building a concrete dome is a bit different than building a normal house. After excavating a hillside, builders put up this big steel frame, fill it with foam, and essentially blast it with layer upon layer of concrete. Then they pull out the foam and they have a shell that's more than four inches thick. They cover that shell back up with all the dirt. It took him about three years to finish the project in Chatsworth, and by the end, Eddie had this big two-story home that has this normal front to it, but the rest of it is buried in the hillside. And it wasn't long before a wildfire burned through the area. There was a massive wildfire that started on the north end of the 118, jumped the freeway, came down all the way through, and burned all the way down to the ocean. And my neighborhood was actually completely threatened by this. I mean, there was a piece of me that was like, I kept telling myself, you know, you're, you're going to be okay because three sides of the house are buried and the top is buried. The amount of exposure you have to a fire is, is minimal. When I got up there and after the fire and realized that I was pretty much, I was unscathed, I, it was, it was a good feeling. I mean, I realized that, that all of the trouble and fighting and, you know, money spent and everything else was well worth it, that I had a uh, uh, you know, a property where f I, I didn't have to worry about a, a fire issue. Eddie is so inspired by the resilience of this house that he eventually decides he wants to build another, his second dome home, in a part of L.A. that's even more vulnerable to wildfire. Eddie wanted to move to Topanga Canyon, one of the areas that could easily one day burn violently because wind-driven fires in our steep canyons can be nearly impossible to stop. But Eddie's only going to live there if he can do his crazy shit in the safest way possible, by building his fancy concrete dome. Would I build a conventional house in Topanga Canyon? Absolutely not. I wouldn't build a conventional house pretty much anywhere in the U.S. anymore. 
for roughly the same amount of money, you can build a house that will save you tens of thousands of dollars a year in utility costs and insurance costs, and you won't have and you'll have a peace of mind of not having to worry about your house getting obliterated by the next natural disaster that shows up. All told, Eddie says he spent $1.1 million building his second home, almost double what he budgeted. So how'd it come out? Well, I took a trip to see for myself. It's really cool. Great ocean breeze coming up this canyon too from the ocean. I mean, I, I wouldn't mind living here. I'm in Topanga Canyon, standing in the driveway of the dome home. And from the road, it looks like you're driving by a small hill, like any other in the canyon. But you walk around, and suddenly, you've got this face of a modern-looking white home, sitting flush with the mountainside, covered in giant windows. And it's really tough to find the front door. Am I at the right? <laughs> I know I'm in the right place. But there's no front door because the other side is on the... is buried in the mountain. It's tucked into the hillside. The walls are all either painted concrete or stucco. There are no eaves to catch on fire. There are no vents for embers to fly into. Even the garage door, it looks like one solid wall. You could tell this place that is tucked into the hillside was clearly meant to withstand, you know, the ravages of nature and the threat of wildfire. And that is extremely cool. I mean, I guess if I had to pick a place in the middle of a place that burns, this would probably be it. You're also gonna have a great view of the fire <laughs> from on top of this hill as it burns. I think back to what David Shu told me as we walked around Coffee Park. Eddie's home literally doesn't have a fence or eaves to burn. No vents I could find. And around it, there's a ton of defensible space, mostly gravel and concrete, with only a couple succulents far from the foundation. If a fire did come, there's nothing close enough to the structure that might sustain a flame. And even as embers pelted the giant wall of concrete and glass, I don't see a way that they could get inside, which I did want to see as well. So I called up the guy Eddie sold the home to, Amir Mudugov, who offered to show me around. And as soon as we walked inside, the fact that this is a giant concrete dome tucked into a hillside becomes immediately clear. So the windows are only facing out towards Correct. kind of this one direction, obviously, because there is a, a mountainside behind us that it's baked into. Yes, and did you notice that um, the um, you don't need AC? Like, outside it's pretty hot, yeah. and because it's in the hill, basically, uh, you don't need AC, so it's perfect. So here is the where you put all that stuff. Mm. There's a closet. The closet but, yeah. it, but it's like the wall is, like, curved, and you can even see the... Uh, you can see like some sort of metal beam that's curved into like the top of the dome almost. Yeah. Truthfully, it is like a bunker crossed with a modern home with high-end oh, amenities right. and a spectacular down canyon view. As I say, Jacob, I'm still, I can't believe that I got this house. I'm serious, like I really, like I'm really in love with it. If you're curious what the home looks like, I've got pictures up on my Instagram, at Jacob Margolis. What Eddie did by building this home was try and approach the problem of risk from the outset, to try and do something different than what everyone else has been doing. And what he found was that doing something different has a cost. While his first dome home in Chatsworth took three years to build, the home in Topanga took 13 years. The whole time he struggled with permitting and construction issues, in part, he thinks, because his approach to building a home was so different than what anyone was used to. And after spending over a million dollars, he decided to sell it to recoup his costs. By the end of the process, I wasn't sleeping. I was talking to my therapist at least a couple times a day. I was depressed. Um, it adversely affected my marriage. I was in the hospital twice with chest pains, thinking I was having a heart attack, and it was stress-related from dealing with this. These sorts of alternative approaches to housing are popping up here and there in California. For instance, in the shadow of the campfire up in Paradise, some people built homes made of steel, hoping for more fire resilience. For Eddie's home, we tried to find some other examples we could compare it to. And that was a bit hard. There have been plenty of underground homes built throughout history. And in 2015, a concrete dome home in Washington state survived a wildfire. 
while the rest of the neighborhood burned. But when it comes to Eddie's house, we won't know how it'll perform in a fire until one shows up. At the very least, it seems to meet a lot of David Shue's recommendations. Defensible space, no clear places for embers to get in, and surely, it helps that most of the house is buried beneath tons of dirt. I think the, the message to people is this. You've got you to gotta look at what we've done so far and accept that it doesn't work. And you got to look at the reality of, of the situation we're living in. This is going to happen every year, every two or three years. We're going to be threatened with fire on a regular basis. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. It's important for us to think of alternatives when it comes to homes here in California. But building concrete domes for everyone is obviously not a feasible, large-scale solution. There are bigger things to figure out. Like, what do we do for all the people with houses in areas that maybe didn't show up on any fire risk map, but now might burn down? What do we do for the people who don't have money to move or retrofit? In all the reporting I've done on this, I haven't seen any good large-scale solutions. Look, learning about all the big, expensive, systemic challenges we're facing can make you feel small and helpless. But... There are things you can do to empower yourself, to take prep into your own hands. And that's what our next episode is all about. We brought in a firefighter of 30 years and talked to him about how to know when you need to evacuate, and what you should do if you're stuck inside a house when it catches on fire, and what to pack in your go bag. I would love it if you can kind of give me a quick assessment of, of my, my stuff that I got here. I'd give you a B plus. I would focus more on things that will sustain you that's next time on The Big Burn. The Big Burn is created, written, reported, and hosted by me, Jacob Margolis. Shana Naomi Krokmal is our vice president of podcasts. Antonia Serajito and Leo G are the executive producers for LAS Studios. Our producer is Minju Park, with additional production by Anjali Sastry Kerbacek and Monica Bushman. Bruno Lopez Vega is our intern. Natalie Chudnovsky is the senior producer. Editing by Meg Kramer. Fact-checking by Caitlin Antonios. Professor Teresa Greger is our native cultural content reader. Sound design and mixing by E. Scott Kelly. Original music by Andy Clausen. Our website, laus.com, is designed by Andy Cheatwood and the digital and marketing teams at LAS Studios. The marketing team of LAS Studios created our branding. Artwork for the show by Dan Carino. Thanks to the team at LAS Studios, including Taylor Kaufman, Sabir Brara, Kristen Hayford, Kristen Moeller, Andy Orozco, Michael Cosentino, and Leo G. Support for this podcast is made possible by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe that quality journalism makes Los Angeles a better place to live. The Strelo family and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. The Big Burn is a production of LAS Studios. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. The Big Disaster, The Big Bird, is only possible because listeners like you step up to support it financially. Making a donation to power this unique intersection of science reporting and storytelling during our fall fund drive is a great way to help. We can't do this without your partnership. Go to las.com slash join to make a difference today. Making a donation to power this unique intersection of science reporting and storytelling during our fall fund drive is a great way to help. Is that that?